The title of the limit of control. Yeah. Um, well, I think we. Um, I think our our, our talk is, is about um, radicalism and radical art and, and the concept of radicality. Uh, so we, we started talking about the uh, the etymology uh, of of radical, and 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 there will will say something about that. But uh, it turns out that one 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 of of the meanings it has, you know, in when when uh, when an American surfer says that something is radical, when something is rad, <laughs> then it means that 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 you are you 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 are taking your surfing to the limits of control. Uh, and, and that's that's actually a very nice um, uh, sort of signification of, of the term okay. that you're doing something at, at the so, yeah. and and accordingly we, we we will also do some uh, some surfing uh, today between between things we can talk about in this okay. in this context. Yeah. Um, also at limits of control because I feel like a total um, dilettante in terms of um, speaking about radicality. But um, so when we started by googling and um, googling the etymology, and um, I was um, like my work has to do a lot with Catholicism, and um, and I, I was aware of the term um, radicality in terms of a, um, in the meaning of a um, 14th century methodological meaning, um, meaning going to the root of something. Um, so it comes from a Christian philosophical um, context, um, scholasticism, and um, maybe we could say from a fundamental um, co um, context. And um, so we and it has, it shares the root of radishes, radish root. This is a photo from a Christian website speaking about radicality and. Um, um, of course, if you're rooted in the Bible or in Jesus, that gives you strength in the world. world. This is the um, roots where um, mosses are nesting, and mosses are um, plants I'm in interested in at the moment. They're plants without roots, like algae and leek lichens. They can grow wherever, so they're surfer, surfer plants. <laughs> This is what happens to a tree that's not rooted, that's not radical. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Bavarian dish, a radish salad, very pretty. Very nice, it's just salt and radish, put into this rococo shape. <laughs> um, and chives. And, um, we also eat radishes um, at Passover, um, Seder evening, Passover evening, or Jews eat radish, and they dip the radishes into salted water. And this is to remember physically, bodily, to experience um, the grief of being in exile and the grief of wandering through the desert. So it's going back to the root of their history by eating a radish. <laughs> this is a carnival group called the Radishes, wearing wooden masks, an activist radish group, a radical group. This is another photo of a long radish. I think we speak about, um, we speak about um, shame later on. and. Um, I was really a bit afraid of this talk because um, um, radicality seems to be such a good thing that would, um, or such an important thing or po being political is such a good and important thing and there are people who are, um, there seems to be maybe a certain competitiveness about um, that. So, a long radish. And this is um, some radish art, a bronze sculpture showing radishes. So it's about the relationship of radicality and um, radicality and art, maybe, which is um, core to our to what we want to speak about. Um, yeah, uh, I'm 
I'm, I'm going to go a little back in, in history, a little back in, in art history, uh, <coughs> talk about uh, the artist I wrote about in my dissertation, uh, Sture Johannesson, uh, uh, who's mainly known for producing psychedelic posters or underground posters <coughs> in the late 60s. Uh, he was also involved with the, Scan with the Scandinavian wing of the Situationists. In, in the 60s. Uh, I'm going to start with a work of his from the 70s, though, uh, on an exhibition he curated together with his partner, Anne Charlotte Johannesson, uh, at Kulturhuset in Stockholm. And it was, um, uh, yeah, 1976, it was an exhibition that took place a month after Ulrike Meinhof died. Ulrike Meinhof, uh, the the German militant or, or terrorist who was a member of the Red Army Fraction. Uh, and she died in, in a prison in, in Stuttgart, I think, or she was killed. Uh, Stein. Stein. Uh, the, the exhibition was, um, <coughs> was called Is the Pen Mightier Than the Sword? And it dealt with, uh, it, it dealt with uh, the theme of freedom of speech. And in, in Germany around this time, the, the, the government had just introduced the uh, the, the Rufsverbot paragraph, which meant that if you were if you were politically involved, if you were you know uh, you know if if you were a radical uh, leftist or a radical rightist, then then you could be fired from your work if you were working you for the state. You had to be a or, communist member of the Communist Party to be fired. Okay, okay, so it was all, all, only radical yeah, left then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, uh, and, and Angela and Sturio Henderson wanted to uh, debate whether freedom of speech was any better off in, in Sweden. Uh, and so they, they with, with their exhibition, they, they only focused on Ulrike Meinhof and not on the other members of the Red Army fraction. So, so not on Andreas Bader, for example. Um, they did this because Ulrike Meinhof had a, had a career as a, as a journalist previous to her career as a militant or as a terrorist, and she had also written books about pedagogy. Um, so, and, and, and that was the, you know, it was the entire story of Ulrike Meinhof's uh, social engagement that they wanted to address with this. Um, and uh, it should be said that the, the, the exhibition was never opened, it, it, was, uh, it was censored on the opening day, because the opening day coincided with the um, with the wedding day of the Swedish king and Queen Sylvia, and Queen Sylvia was another German woman who was in, in, in the in the eye of public attention around that. She she was the daughter of a German industrialist who had some shady dealings during the, the Second World War, and uh, the the poster for the exhibition that Johannesson produced was this. You know, you see this na Nazi dagger that, that cuts off some some colored pencils in the German colors. Uh, this poster was was fly posted uh, all along the route of where, where the marriage royal couple should be riding in their horse carriage after after the wedding. And and this was too too you know too big of a provocation. Uh, so uh, the authorities shut the exhibition down before it was ever opened. Um, but I think this is, uh, I mean, this to, to us looking at this today is, is you know, an, an, an image of, of radicality or, or an image of, of a radical engagement. Uh, I mean, we, we can recognize this as an image of, of radicalism because it deals with Ulrike Meinhof as a symbol of, of resistance. Uh, it should be added, though, that there are also some, some stranger elements in the exhibition. Uh, you can see these um, um, these tapestries here, and this one are uh, tapestries made by Angela Johannesson, and they are they they they're just radically strange. Basically, this one, for example, is uh, depicts uh, Snoopy uh, from Peanuts, who's you know so sometimes he imagines he sees he, uh, the Red Baron from the World War One. And he's sitting on, and then he, he flies, you know, he flies his imaginary airplane on top of his kennel. In in, in this case, his kennel is uh, has been colored in, in the German colors, and then it says Freidirach there, and then he's he's shooting a machine gun on a tank that's driving around. 
it is really peculiar, you know, this sort of, you know, um, uh, tapestry weaving, this kind of you know, Snoopy in the context of a Baker mind book. It's like, oh, it's, 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 it's really strange. Um, then the, um, yeah, this was another element from the exhibition, the, the funeral wreath of Ulrike Meinhof, Sturio Hennes, and had come to the, to the graveyard, to the cemetery where Meinhof was buried, and then he had, from, from, from the rubbish bin, he had, he had fished out the, the funeral wreath that, that she had been given by her comrades. So, 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 so this was also on display. Um, so this is, uh, this is what, what, what he's known for, basically, this sort of psychedelic type work. Um, and, um, and this is uh, his, his famous poster, his most famous poster, perhaps called Called the Hash Girl from 1969. Um, and um, I think psychedelic art is typically not considered radical because it's it, well, it, it, it doesn't really con conform with an idea of radicalism because it's considered too amorphous or too loose or too stylish or too hedonist. Um, uh, Adorno, in his aesthetic theory, uh, writes that, uh, that, that a radical modernism, a radical modernist art, such as Kandinsky, this is his example, a radical modernist art revolted against the sensualism of Jugendstil. The, 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 the sensualism uh, of human steel. So, you know, uh, sens sensualism what was considered too loose for radical modernism. And, you know, there is a lot of human steel in, in psychedelic, uh, psychedelic visuality as well. So, so uh, sensualism is never radical, no? I don't, I don't know. Well, to, uh, to sort of, to, to this, to, to an almost academic perspective, it, it would be, and, and to what, what he calls radical modernism. <coughs> And also, yeah, sorry. Oh, it's like the same, as the same um, paradigm happened like um, mm. if you look at 80s art and 90s art, like 80s art is not radical because it's painting, or like there's a debugging happening in the 90s in the politicization of art. No? Yeah. <laughs> because, because of sensualism, or? Yeah. yeah. I don't know this because of sensualism, no, but it's a, something. Um, mm. It's a problem in political art and sensualism. Yeah, that's yeah, definitely. Um, no, and I, I, I don't. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good point. I, I don't think I don't think as uh, a psychedelic art, if one can call it that at all. Is, is only sensualist. It's all, you know, psychedelic art is always something super composite and uh, and messy and, and and unclean because it has a sensualist side, but also a, a spiritual side. No, um, uh, no, 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 it's great. And uh, I think this is, I mean, to, to to me, this type of work is also a radical or was a radical aesthetic as well. Uh, also because. Uh, f fundamentally, a great part of it was bullshit, uh, and, and I mean bullshit in a quite specific sense. You know, uh, bullshit as as something that is unconnected to a concern with truth. Uh, bullshit as something that is unconnected with uh, settled beliefs. And uh, you know, it's it's a settled belief, for example, that sensualism and political art doesn't have anything to yes. do with each other. Um, so in this sense, in, in this type of work, Henderson is. Is also messing with the fundament or the basis of <coughs> reality uh, as it is normally perceived and consensuated. Um, now, the reason why I started with, with, with the 70s project and then went back to this, uh, to this hippie work from, from the 60s is that typically one talks about uh, the 60s and the 70s in terms of a radicalization, you know, it started out with flower power and good vibes and love, and then and then things became tougher and more militant and you know, and this compromising in the 70s, uh, artists uh, became engaged in, in in squads or you know community organizing, etc. etc. But but I think there's something to be said for the fact that you know that that, that this was also a, a type of radical <coughs> thinking without 
Uh, I don't think that there was a, a clean break between uh, this type of hippie art and, and, and militancy. Um, for, for sure, both, both were anti-authoritarian types of work. This is to say that th this poster was also censored by the authorities. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, it really was meant to be an exhibition poster for uh, for an exhibition that took place at Lund's Kunsthalle. Uh, when the poster was made before the exhibition opened, and when the board of the Kunsthalle saw this, you know, draw idealizing pornographic poster, they thought that no, this is just it, this is not going to work. Uh, so they, uh, they they told the artist, they told Johannesson that in order for him to get his fee, he had to, you know, submit the entire edition of the poster. Uh, so so the whole edition of the poster was sequestered basically. Uh, however, so 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 the so so the social democratic establishment uh, disliked the poster. However, the the, the orthodox left wing also hated the poster because um, because they thought that it was too frivolous. Uh, Johannesson made fun of the political uh, figure of uh, Che Guevara, who is, uh, who's, you know, the, the little heads of Che Guevara who are floating up as little <laughs> colored bubbles from, from, from the hash pipe here. So, you know, and, and then this was something you couldn't do with the hero of the revolution, you know. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre has said that you know, Che Guevara is the most complete human being of our time. <laughs> you don't, you don't color him purple. <laughs> Um, so you know, this is you know, so so th this is also a way of you know, th this is how how radical the bullshit was, in in this sense because it, or to put it in a more polite way, so that it, it it scrambles the parameters of what what, what political art can be. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so you know, is going to court for another offence also in the sixties. In a way, this uh, so just to, to get away from 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 the from all the good anecdotes here, uh, Jacques Derrida writes in '93 this brilliant book about Marx uh, called Spectres of Marx, uh, or it's, the book is actually based on three lectures he gives at Berkeley University, if if I remember right. But there he sort of he uh, he in the in the end, he sums up what, Mark, what a Marxist critique means to, means to him, and he says that it's a radical kind of critique, that it's a procedure that is ready to undertake its self-critique, a critique that wants itself to be, in principle, and explicitly open to its own transformation, re-evaluation, and self-interpretation. Um, and I think that's, that, that's really, I think it's, it's, it's a great way of summing up a Marxist critique, but it's also something that that can be brought to bear on, on, on aesthetic work and how, how what, 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 what art is, I guess, uh, to be. I, I, I like the skepticism and the self-skepticism that, 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 that this notion of a radical critique conveys. Um, yeah. Uh, also, yeah, just in, in parenthesis, while we're talking about self-critique, I should mention that I've 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 I've, really, I've I've worked a lot on the work of Sturio Henderson, and I I used to talk about it as radical psychedelia actually, <laughs> and today I'm not sure what what it means to call something radical psychedelia. I think it's it's right to to talk about Johannesson's work in in the context of a radical critique in in this sense, for example. But but radi but radical psychedelia. What what is that? Um, uh, I think that there, 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 is, there is a risk that, that radical stands in for a compensation or for a lack. I came across this uh, great quote the other day by uh, one, one of the uh, Italian Marxist philosophers of the 60s, Mario Tronchi. Uh, and, and Mario Tronchi says that um, Mario Tronchi is he, he, he's, he's one of the 60s guys. In, in, in Italian philosophy, and he was uh, he was sort of um, he disagreed a lot with the 70s generation of, of Marxists in, in Italy. Uh, Antonio Negri belongs to the 70s generation, I believe. And um, he says that well, Mario Franci says that well, in, in the 70s they talked about radical politics, but actually, well, the adjective radical 
before the word politics means that politics could no longer stand alone. So in this sense, the idea that if you, if you talk about radical politics, then that already points to a certain deficit in, in politics. So, um, so, so one should be careful of not compensating with, with radicality. Maybe one should ask the question in a different way. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to give a, a, a yeah, I'm going to catch another way, and I'm going to talk. About, I'm going to make a brief introduction to the work of Andrea uh, because uh, it's uh, Andrea's work is uh, it, it, it deals in a certain way with 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 what can be considered a, a, a fundamentalist aesthetics or, or what has been, been read as such. Um, and it also, her work also deals with a, a radical take on, uh, on visual culture. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a woodcut of Andreas from this year? Last year. Last year. What was it called? Um, oh yeah, so yeah. Um, and I think Andreas' work uh, differs from, from a lot of other contemporary art by, uh, well, by, by, not, uh, by not being related to the tradition of the ready-made, nor is it specific to any medium, really. So she, she doesn't, um, um, I, I like it because Andrea doesn't refer to any of the obvious things in her work, or the obvious strategies. <coughs> There is also a, a strong uh, social dimension in her work, uh, in which she deals with uh, with universals or fundamentals of work, gender, community, spirituality, economy, and and she often deals with these fundamental uh, concepts or notions through uh, religious motives or religious subjects such as nuns. This is from a video I did a few years ago called Little Works, which uh, documents um, uh, little works or, or little artworks uh, produced by, by a group of nuns in London. Um, so it's uh, so so when 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 I say that work deals with communities, it's often religious communities, close religious communities. Um, uh, at, at the same time, I think Andreas work is also work that's sort of highly aware of itself as, as art. So it's, it creates a discussion about the inherent problematics of, of, of the aesthetic and what, what aesthetic work means to them. Um, so, um, and this is, uh, maybe we should take this one. This is an exhibition view from the Free Ustilling from uh, the exhibition that Andrea participated in, Soft Shields of Pleasure. And I think when in, in, in her display, in, her, in the installation of her work, there's always a, a great deal of attention paid to how, um, you know, you, you have these sort of, you have this sort of, almost sort of post-war humanist aesthetic, but at the same time, uh, I think she's paying a lot of attention to, to, uh, to an aesthetic of, of political art and what, um, Political art looks like, and what it's what it looks like when it is displayed. Um, and besides, there's um, in in Andreas's work, there's always um, there's always a discussion with the work of other artists, uh, artists such as Dieter Roth or Andy Warhol, uh, but also historical figures such as uh, Giotto. Uh, so in Andreas work there's always quite a crowd in which there are uh, lively art historical discussions going on. Um, uh, I'll just... Can I speak about shame? Yes, yeah, speak about shame maybe. <laughs> yeah. first became interested in shape in shape. Okay, can I say oh, something? Yeah. Can I say yes, something? Yes, just <laughs> <laughs> um, yes they, I, I just wanted to, uh, to to say something about the untimeliness of your work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the fact that there I, I also I, I like the fact that there are that there are so many sort of untimely or anachronic 
elements in uh, Andreas's work. You know, the, the, the religious, the humanism, uh, the existential, and the uh, questions of morality as well, which is something that, uh, that you know, that you think that, well, why, 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 why does contemporary art deal with that? <coughs> in the same way, it's, it's, it's rare to see the medium of wood cutting uh, in, in today's art world. Um, and on, on some occasions, this is something that has provoked strong, strong uh, audience reactions. Like, and I had an exhibition in Karlsruhe a few years ago, where, where you know, where it, this is not an installation, group, but 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 it was it, it was worked like this, you know, wood cuttings and stuff. And some members of the audience saw it as uh, as a, or they read it as a straightforwardly religious art. And they considered Andreas' work a, a, a throwback to, to post-war Germany, basically. Um, so, so, you know, they, they didn't see the religious as, as a legitimate subject for, for contemporary art. And, uh, but I, I really think it's interesting, all, the, you know, all, all this, the, the, this anachronism <laughs> in it, and also, uh, also the question of morality, actually, which... Uh, uh, of, of course, I, I don't think of morality in your work as a way of taking a moral high ground or of preaching, obviously, uh, but more as a kind of a, of, of a drama of, of forces that struggle for our souls. And s to talk about soul also sounds off or anachronic, um, but um, <laughs> with soul I don't think of, of something that is hiding inside a body. But I, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of, of, of the gravity of the body, uh, basically, as um, you know, the, the soul is what gives bodies um, an affinity for each other. What, what the soul is what gives bodies space, you know, or a soul is the precondition for collective experience, you could say. Um, could you say the Sartre quote again about... Um, about Che Guevara? Yeah. Uh, he says, some, uh, Sartre says somewhere that, uh, you know, this uh, Che Guevara is, is, is the hero of the revolution. He's the most complete human being of our times. Uh, I, I, I don't know when he says it, but I, I suppose it's before Che Guevara is killed, which is 67. But it has also to do with the question of anachronism that we laugh about a quote like this. No? Hmm. Um. Sorry to yeah, shame. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, a screen test by Andy Warhol, and it's the own. There are two Warhol did many many screen tests, and um, there are only two screen tests where the people wear sunglasses. One of them is a self portrait, and um, also Sartre wrote a lot about shame. Um, and he says it's us feeling that we are in the eye of the others or that we're subjects seen by others. Um, and um, that's how subjectivity is created. And um, also that's how art is created. No, it's something that's almost more looked at by others. And we don't feel shame in the moment when we read because then we are concentrated in a kind of, it's a, it's a kind of, yeah, in a world on our own. And, um, and um, sunglasses are also part of a coolness discourse, which also relates to shame. So I became interested in shame in the 90s because I was interested in things that um, last was anachronistic and, um, and um, people were in, in Berlin back then were very much interested in political display art. And um, there was a, so, was a certain look to art, so um, even though it's post-conceptual practice, it's, it's supposed to look in a certain way, even though medium is not important. Anyway, I thought um, while art is supposed to be a space of a run of freedom, I'm, I'm ashamed of so many things, like um, would I write a poem somewhere, or do I want my parents to come to private views? Also, I'm, I have to say, I was younger back then, so more shame prone. Yeah? It's also a problem of adolescent shame. Um, and um, shame has to do with um, the public, certainly. When we feel shame, we feel um, um, 
we feel a norm that we have learned. Yeah? So uh, when we feel ashamed to do a certain kind of art, then we experience um, norms that we have incorporated, what is legitimate art. That's the art we're not ashamed of, legitimate art. Um, that's um, another self-portrait by um, Andy Warhol, a very early self-portrait. Also, yeah. also, of course, Andy Warhol was gay and Catholic, and, um, um, mm -hmm. but when he started, it was called he was queer. People who were, who were gay were, were queer, and that's like just strange also. So queerness refers to many things, as everybody knows. It's when we feel shame that we feel that we're different, we feel that we're in a group um, and that we're different in the group, we're singul singulated. Um, this is a sculpture um, by Martin Kippenberger, Martin up in the Ecke und schäm dich. Um, Martin and go into the cor corner and shame on you. And he always um, exhibited this sculpture um, together with paintings, with his own paintings. So it's a self-portrait of the shameful artist in relation to his work and in relation to the audience that he shows the back to. It's about being looked at. Um, And another artist that's very important to me in relation to shame is um, Peter Roth. Um, this is an installation view of um, the work he did when he represented um, Switzerland at the Venice Biennale in 1982. Mm -hmm. And um, it shows um, a wall of um, super uh, of um, super eight projection film material projected films that he filmed from the invitation to um, show at the Biennale until the opening of the Biennale films of his private life and um, he said he thought about himself as a bad filmmaker so the whole question of judgment is of course a question of shame this is good and this is bad. And this is how we um, deal with art in our culture. And I don't, th I don't say that's a bad thing. Um, um, and Dieter Roth said, because I'm a bad filmmaker, I'm ashamed to show just one film, because people will see that I'm a bad filmmaker. <laughs> so um, he showed many films, a whole film installation, as a detraction from the fact um, um, that he's a bad filmmaker. So people are overwhelmed. So many artistic strategies are shame avoidance strategies. Shame is a very productive um, emotion because um, it teaches us culture and it teaches us um, um, elegance and it um, and it teaches us. Um, yeah, maybe it teaches. It's a heuristic emotion. It teaches us ways to avoid shame. Um, while he was filming these films, he also wrote a diary, Dieter Roth, Ein Tagebuch, a diary from the year 1982. And this was also part of um, his um, Biennale contribution, um, a handwritten diary. Um, and he, in this diary, he really wrote about his private life. And, um, one shame is uh, Dieter Roth is interesting because it, on the one hand he's like a predecessor to um, strategies like um, Jason Emin that's very underrated as he was very underrated as an artist in my opinion and um, and um, 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 on the other hand um, there's nothing obvious there's no unmade bad in Dieter Roth's work there's no obviously shameful content it's about the sheer act of showing. Um, so shame is, is structurally related to showing art and to, and to taking something from the studio and exhibiting it. It's close to exhibiting and exhibitionism are very related words and wanting to show but also fearing to be seen. And um, in, this, in the foreword to this um, diary, Dieter Roth wrote, this should be written about art how ashamed I feel about it, about good art or bad art, 
and about everything connected but a big depression that sits in me for two years does keep me from writing anything clearly to, about this hard thing. So I write here a page filler. So the diary, like the projections, are page fillers yeah? because it's very difficult to speak to show your shame clearly. Impossible for the throat. Maybe I should say that um, I, I became interested in it because I, um, there's this discourse about a culture of shamelessness. Visual culture is a shameless culture. And um, I think that's utterly not the case. Um, the more visual a culture um, becomes, the more um, relevant shame is. And the more the question of hiding and showing and um, embarrassment is interesting. This is um, maybe has to be a soul too. It's um, 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 in Tübingen, the Neckar, the river Neckar, and this little yellow house and the tower is the to um, famous Hölderlin tower. The tower where Hölderlin um, German poet used to live um, while he was psych um, a psych psychiatric case basically before psychiatry existed and in confinement. So I'm, I'm thinking about um, issues of inwardness a lot and um, um, Paul Zeller, another uh, German poet, um, Jewish, um, coming from the concentration camps and Adorno wrote about the impossibility of poetry after Auschwitz and Zeller said about the um, about art and vegetation and about the Erweiterung der Kunst von Expansion. Expansion of the art. So he said, no, I'm not, is, not interested in expansion of the art at all. Um, go into your own, I, I say it in German first, um, gehe in deine eigene Engel und setze sie frei. Um, go into your own most inner tightness or denseness or Narrowness. Narrowness and set it free. Um, so that's about the can be this narrowness can be a feeling of shame, for example. But in this narrowness, you feel uh, you feel of course the social and you feel culture. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. When, 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 when we talked about. Uh, about our presentation, <laughs> you, you, had a, you, had, you had some some thoughts about <coughs> uh, writing versus making visual art, or where you said were you? I, I, I don't know how you put it, but you said something along the lines of of, of writing being a more radical practice. Mm. Uh, yeah, I just thought about the fact that I think I, like I was never moved by visual art in the way that I was, was moved by. The text, huh? and I was wondering why that is the case, but maybe it's just a personal thing. But I, um, it's a more intimate address, I guess, reading and writing. Yeah. <clears throat> um, could work on your work a kind of appropriation art? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably a stupid question, but it's uh, it just... You see, um, I'm interested in, for example, the discourse of appropriation art is, has only been written in terms of, really in terms of like gender or um, straightforward political mm -hmm. art. There's, I think Sturtevant is very explicit about the fact that she copies what she loves. Yeah? And, um, and um, that's something I find quite interesting in terms of appropriation art. Um, it's a it's a discourse of commitment and it's a it's a discourse of exposure to appropriation. Also, my work um, of course, there is appropriation in my work yeah, of medieval art. Of, yeah. of, of um, so this is uh, from a from a Giotto fresco, um, 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 a man drinking from a creek. Um, 
uh, some kind of miracle that um, St. Francis did. Yeah, it's appropriation. I don't know. Only in terms <laughs> of appropriation art being a committed art. Yeah. Kind of art. Yeah. Um. And appropriation art having to do with legal practice as well. Yeah. Copying. Yeah. Incorporating. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, uh, so, so it's not uh, because usually appropriation is something that relates to to, to the ready made and, and that kind of tradition, you know, like uh, I don't know, Jeff Koons taking a, <laughs> a a vacuum cleaner and putting it in a tree or something. But mm -hmm. but if it's about copying and and about copying things one loves, mm -hmm. <laughs> then there's a different mm -hmm. kind of distance mm -hmm. or or ing, mm -hmm. yeah, or intimacy. Mm -hmm. Um, it's uh, yeah, radicality, and we. Uh, you know, often when one when one talks about a, a radical art, one talks about uh, uh, activism as an example of of, of a radicalized art, and um, <clears throat> I think that's uh, it's Sturio Hennison would would be one example of, of an image politics or quasi-activist practice. Uh, so, so is at Reinhardt actually, uh, strange as it sounds. Um, uh, but he's, he is at the same time, he's an example of, of an artist who, who, who goes into his, his inner inge, or it was, who goes into his inner narrowness. Because uh, Reinhardt is, he died in 67, um, and he's, he's famous for his, you know, He's a New Yorker artist. He was, I think he was new, an abstract painter. He's the only abstract painter of his generation who only ever painted abstract. He never painted figurative painting. And he was, uh, you know, he, he was very much the, the, the modernist, uh, uh, thinking about art in terms of negation and autonomy. So he, he wrote these amazing texts or, or manifestos where he said that, you know, art is art, everything else is everything else. Uh, so really sort of, you know, separating art from the social uh, and it's, you know, it's the right kind of art, it's not your art. <laughs> so very sort of, you know, hard-nosed, confrontational types of, 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 of negation. Um, he's... Um, and, you know, in, in, in many senses, this is as conservative as one gets, in a sense, uh, as also this, this uh, photo witnesses. You know, we have, a, we have a white guy painting abstract, studio practice, uh, black monochromes. He, he painted black monochromes for the last 10 years of his life, I think. <laughs> um, and uh, so, but, but at the same time, he, there, there was a, you know, what, what one can call this a, a radical position in a sense, but it's, uh, it's arguably anachronic today, you know, it is difficult to do the same kind of, uh, to, to, to invest the same kind of radicality in abstract painting today. Um, what's interesting is that uh, he, he, about him and his radicality is that he talked about his, uh, his separate selves, uh, so that his, his, his multiple personalities, in a sense. Because apart from being an abstract painter, he was also uh, he was a labor organizer. He organized uh, pickets and, and, um, and protests in the 30s. Um, and he was also, um, that, that, that was another one of his separate selves. A, a third of his separate selves was, uh, was, uh, was the fact that he was a commercial artist. So he would design uh, album covers for, 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 for jazz records, for example, and he would be, you know, he would, he would, he would, he was, he was a freelance art director as well, self-employed. Um, and besides, he also did satirical cartoons, such as these. You probably know some of his, uh, some of his cartoons. He did, he did some very funny ones about the art world, for example, and he also, he also drew cartoons for uh, communist newspapers and magazines. Uh, in the 30s and 40s, um, magazines called New Masses and Soviet Russia today. Um, so you know, so so he was, um, um, 
So you know, I I I, I would like to think that uh, that you know the, the the fact of this multiplicity of his activities, the you know the the fact of his separate selves where he worked with different activities in parallel, uh, that this fact complicates the easy reading of his, uh, of his painting uh, as a straightforwardly modernist position. You know, in, in, his, in his texts about art and in his painting, he, he definitely separates art from life. You know, that's, you know, that's very sort of high modernist in that sense. Um, and he had a very unforgiving stance against the corruption of art. You know, he was he was always railing against art, the art market, the art institutions, or art that he considered too poetic or too loose. You know, he said that art, art, art shouldn't be loose. You know, art shouldn't be available. It shouldn't be open. Um, so you know, so then he sort of he, he proceeded through these very sort of sharp dichotomies of you know, Citizen is one thing, artist is another. Fine art is one thing, applied art is another. Activism is a third thing. You know, mass culture is one thing, high culture is another. But at the same time, he, he worked with both with both things. So so he actually he actually managed to somehow span these differences, and he allowed them to uh, to 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 exist in in close proximity with each other. You know, he could be an, a cartoonist and an activist and a, and a, and a high modernist monochrome painter at the same time. Um, so he doesn't, you know, even if, if he insisted on art as art, then he, he didn't rule out activism. He just assigns it another location in relation to art. So it's a, very, it, it, it's a radical structural analysis, one could say. Uh, he doesn't hybridize between art and activism. And um, I think may, maybe to me this, this is, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an art historian, so I like, I like <laughs> to talk about dead things. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, I think it's it's also interesting because to me, Reinhardt's uh, think art thinking and art practice is not only was not only a question of trying to maintain art pure and art essential. It was also a way of pointing to the limits of of what art can do. Uh, and then that's coming back to your Adorno quote, I guess you, you said it. Adorno says that, yeah, I think it's one of the first lines of his aesthetic theory where he says, you know, the expansion of art, but no, God damn it, <laughs> we'll have none of that. So, in, and, you know, to, today we have a lot of, you know, artists sort of inflated and expanded like never before in the experience economy, for example, you know, art should, art, if, art, if, if it is successful, it should you know draw an audience of two hundred thousand people. Otherwise, you know, otherwise it's a failure. Or more. Uh, or, yeah. um, uh, or perhaps in uh, you know in, in, in certain formulations of art activism that art should solve social problems. That could you know that's completely different from the experience economy. But it could also be discussed as an as an expansion of art and what art can do. And maybe art is something more restricted. Mm -hmm. This is a procession, Mary's Day in 1964 in San Francisco led by Sister Gurita Kent and showing Sister Gurita Kent posters. It looks like activism and it's a mixture of um, a religious holiday and um, pop art. <laughs> that was it? Yes. <laughs> 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 uh, no expansion. <laughs> no expansion. That's the word. Sorry, I'm, yeah, I know I'm being too expensive. Um, okay. Uh, I remember I, I, I forgot the post after this. Sorry. Oh, sorry, that's not. All right. Um, so I, I, I'll talk a bit about. Um, 
about alienation um, and, and estrangement, um, because it's um, uh, it, it was also some what maybe I can say this. A book about um, about um, Sister Gurita was published by Julie Ault, who is a member of Group Material, and lastly, now speak about Group Material. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> uh, but before, before we get to that, I will, <laughs> I will speak a bit about alienation. <laughs> uh, uh, which was also something that came up when we, when we uh, prepared for this. Uh, and it's also something that comes back to our, our, our sort of our shared traumas with 90s art, I guess, um, because we sort of both, you know, uh, we both realized that we're sort of uh, pro historical subjects, products of, of 90s, the 90s art scene. You know. um, and, and alienation is, um, is, is a key, key Marxist concept that has been somewhat forgotten. Um, um, and it's, it's a key concept because it's fundamental to both uh, social critique but also to artistic critique. Um, and um, you know, artistic critique as in as in Bertolt Brecht, of course, who talks about the, the Verbrandung's effect, uh, about about making things strange in order for the audience not to become passive and fall asleep, but you know, to be to be conscious, critical observers. Um, and um, <coughs> I think it's uh, one, um, to me, one can talk about alienation or estrangement in relation to the work of, of Andrea, but also to, to uh, Angelot and Sturio Johannesson, for example. Um, it's also something that relates to the title, to, to the title of our talk, because to Marx, Marx rising in 1844 about alienation and estranged labor. Uh, he basically defines alienation as a loss of control over one's labor. So alienation is a loss of control. Um, and um, Marx writes about this loss of control. He describes it as a kind of uh, a virus or as a kind of viral effect that spreads in social space. Um, you know, one in estrangement or in alienation, one becomes uh, alien from oneself, one becomes alien from other people, uh, and one becomes alien from humanity as such. He says that, that uh, in, in, a, in a state of alienation, one becomes uh, uh, alienated from, from the species being, uh, from the natural state of man, he says. And he says that this, this loss of control, uh, this, this disruption, between life and labor and life and activity, it has it has monstrous <coughs> effects. Um, and of course, the uh, I, I guess there are several reasons for uh, alienation falling out of fashion, or, or, or the fact that it hasn't been been talked a lot about the last since the end of the eighties, perhaps. Um, I mean, one, one of the questions is if one can address alienation without having a concept of nature. Marx talks about, you know, this, you know, uh, alienation is unnatural. You, one, one is removed from the natural state of, of being a human being. And, you know, what, uh, of, of course, uh, nature is an idea that has been, been thoroughly deconstructed since then. Um, and, um, is of course also a, a concept that comes with a long history. Uh, so um, in, the, in the 60s, it's, it's a concept that is, that is criticized by, by a new generation of Marxists um, and a new generation of philosophers. Um, you know, for, for example, there, there's this, uh, there's an, an amazing book written by, uh, by an Italian philosopher, uh, Franco Berardi, that I, I can really recommend you to, to read. The Soul at Work. It, it was him I was quoting on, on the notion of the soul, actually. Um, the Soul at Work, he wrote it 
three years ago, I think. Uh, Berardi is, is, is one of these 70s generation activists. Anyway, he, he describes the, the development of the concept of, of alienation in the 60s and 70s. And he says that um, uh, one stopped using the concept of alienation in the 60s uh, and started talking about estrangement instead. So he distinguishes between alienation and estrangement, uh, which is a dis distinction that works well in English. It doesn't really work in, in Danish, where you talk about Ramagurl, so, so cool, but there is a difference between alienation and estrangement. In alienation, one would be, you know, one would be considered a passive subject. Uh, one would be considered incapable of activity. Um, however, you know, when, when one is estranged, on the other hand, one, one, if one realizes that there's alienation going on, so to speak. So, you know, um, so, you know is, estrangement is, is, a, is potentially a state of refusal or, or, or resistance. You know, alienation is, is a passive state. Uh, it's a loss of self. Estrangement is active. Um, so you know uh, there is. Um, then, then, then later on you have uh, you have philosophers like like Deleuze who talks a lot about affect and whose notion of subjectivity goes through affect. Um, and Deleuze is one who makes it difficult to talk about alienation. Because, uh, because to Deleuze, it's relations of affect and emotion that produce subjectivity. So, you know, uh, relations of affect uh, to Deleuze are a kind of positive alienation uh, whose possibility is creative self-transformation. Uh, and of course, if one wants to talk about alienation or estrangement as a, as a potential state of refusal or resistance, then that, you know, the nurse's take on it makes it somewhat um, soft, in a sense. Um, anyway, so this is, um, uh, I guess, through through alienation or estrangement, one one can radicalize uh, uh, an, an artistic critique, in a sense. I'll just show an example of how artists have, have worked with this. This is um, this, this is an installation view from an exhibition I was involved in curating last year, um, where uh, we worked with uh, uh, various artists' archives, um, group material, among others. Group material uh, was an amazing, um, well, art activist outfit, if you will, uh, that existed in, in New York between 79 and, and uh, 96. And um, it's, um, I think they, they were, you know, the group material had a, had a changing cast of members. The, 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 one, the, the one regular member throughout uh, the whole career was Julie Ault, who wrote this book about Sister Corita. That Andrea talked about. Uh, otherwise, they had a changing cast of members, and they were they, they were dealing with you know the mm, group material what, what was a significant artistic, curatorial, and, and activist voice in uh, North America and Europe through, during the eighties. In this, um, and interestingly, one of the first exhibitions of group material was called Alienation, uh, an, ex an exhibition from nineteen eighty. And, um, and following uh, a Marxist line of thought, group material uh, curated this exhibition, or they introduced it as an exhibition that describes and explains the modern breakup of reality, our separation from society, production, and nature. Um, and um, there. Their, their take on it, their, their take on alienation was, you know, the, you know to, to talk about alienation as a breakup and separation of, you know, relations to society and nature. That, that, that's very sort of Marx and Angelita. They dealt with it in a, in a less worried way or a less orthodox way because they, the exhibition included elements such as um, an evening of ten short, non-boring performance pieces. 
uh, and there was a recital of uh, the Star Spangled Banner and uh, of the Lord's Prayer by one of the group members. And uh, the flyer for the exhibition mimicked uh, the advertising for the, um, uh, for the space shocker Alien uh, that, was, uh, that was produced in 79. And on the opening night, only black coffee was served. And everybody was made to wear, um, uh, you know, these kind of uh, uh, convention badges, you know, saying, you know, hi, my name is, you know, so, uh, so, so they were also playing around with it. Um, and, uh, but it's also the, the theme of alienation is also something that, that relates to the, uh, to the group identity uh, and the collective work of group material. Because they, um, um, of course, they had since since they worked as a collective author, as 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 a, as, a, as an art group, basically, they had to deal with the questions of self-representation, and um, at a pretty early point, they they, they produced this kind of, uh, sort of corporate identity for themselves with this type of of, of letterhead paper. Um, that, yeah that you see here. Um, um, and, and, and they started producing a sort of, you know, they started producing a, a, an identity for themselves or a corporate image in order to be taken seriously by the, by the art establishment. You know, they, they were like, we're never going to get a review in art forum unless we look serious. You know, we, we, have, we have to look like we have our shit together, basically. So, so, so that's how they, they, they produced this. They came up with this, this corporate identity. And, you know, it was, that was, you know, for, for, for an art activist outfit to have this corporate identity was, you know, was, was an, you know, sort of was, was alienating to themselves because, you know, it, it forced them to play the game on a certain level. Um, in order to be, in order to be taken seriously, as they said, by by the art magazines or by by government funding bodies, etc. Um, but then, for the same reason, uh, you know, for, for 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 reasons of of whether you uh, you know where, where where can you feel at home with your with the art you make. Uh, Basically, where 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 is art not alienated or estranged? Uh, for, for that reason, they they um, they abandoned their space at a pretty early point. So in 1981, you know, some a couple of years after they started, they uh, they, they stopped. They, they they gave up on their their own exhibition space, and then they continued their projects in, in institutions or in public spaces. Uh, because they concluded that even uh, they concluded that even a non-profit space was too compromised by the commercial gallery format to to represent a real alternative. Um, so you know th this is also a, a debate with yeah uh, with with alienation in in, in various ways um, and yeah basically yeah, finally I. Just to connect to what you said about visual, uh, visual culture, I think their group material is, is they 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 are they're super interesting. Not least because of, of the very particular sort of visuality they developed. I think they, they, they defined the visuality of cultural theory in a way because they they well you can definitely say that they proceeded with a radical mix of of different visual sources. Um, and different signs, you know, in, in their displays they were juxtaposing abstract painting, advertising, consumer goods, children's drawings, you know, so, so they had this, you know, you know, in the most productive sense of the word, they had a really indifferent uh, take on, on, on the visual signs they operated. It could be art, it could be bumper stickers like this. Um, but still, they, they always worked within the confines of, of you know, aesthetic display. Um, so in that sense, they, their work was probably as much about curating and you know, exhibition making as about as about activism. Because of 
Also, you know that it's it's a good question. Also, because of course um, I, 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 was, I don't know how well I explained it, but I, I was you know talking about this critique of the concept of alienation that you had in the 60s. Is what what was an important moment because it was a way of saying that uh, you know to 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 a very to a very sort of vulgar and orthodox Marxism, then there would be an idea that you could actually actually be non-alienated, you know, that you could, you know, could, that you could supersede alienation, that you, that you could get over it. So, you know, Che Guevara as a complete human being, complete, uh, he, would, he would be, you know, non-alienated, non he would be self-present, you know. Um, and you know, so you had, you know, so spe speaking of, of, you know, about who's got the biggest radish <laughs> as well. You know, there, there, there were a lot of, you know, a lot of this, you know, 60s art that, that one talks about was, you know, it is, it is, it is gendered, uh, definitely. And, and there were a lot of, you know, it is free subjects, uh, definitely a lot of free guys uh, who were unalienated and playful and, you know, delicious in every way. Uh, but, but also for, 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 for this reason, I, I think it's important to, to keep yeah. a notion of, of, of estrangement in, in one's work. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's just you know, a sort of basic sort of uh, Brechtian point I'm trying to make that, you know, that you know, estrangement is important in order to, you know, to, 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 to make sure that uh, that you don't, that one doesn't think that that one's practice is transparent and unalienated. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, that there should be some, some opacity and irritation. 